Welcome to the part Precision Partnering versus Randomized Grouping by Size PD. I'm Allison Duncan. And I'm Rachel Marshall. And we're going to be taking you today through some things about precision partnering and randomized groupings. As with everything we do in Canyon School District, everything ties back to our MTSS framework of support. Today's topic falls under scaffolded instruction and groupings. Today you're going to learn about the difference between randomized grouping and precision partnering so that you can choose the appropriate grouping structure for your lesson goals. You'll know you're successful when you can implement both structures at the appropriate time. Something to think about, the way in which we group students for collaborative problem solving actually impacts the way that students engage in the collaborative effort. We know that when we put students to together to work together that their understanding can become deeper. Well, how we actually form those groups will affect how they engage in the collaborative process. So we're going to go over what precision partnering is first. This is something that we've talked about a lot in Canyon School District, so most of this will be a reminder, but it's really a way of organizing your classrooms into different types of partnerships so that different types of discussions can occur. Also, so that precision part means how you're arranging the student partnerships and you're using data. That's the real big part of precision partnering is that data piece. You're using data to arrange those partnerships. This data, math or reading inventory, unit test scores, assignment scores, any, any type of data that, um, that you use in your classroom. There are some other things to consider. First of all, also consider their English language competence, how they can, if they're able to communicate, you might need to put a lower English speaking person like new to the country with someone who speaks their same language or also someone who is a little bit more compassionate and patient in order to help them understand what is going on. Also their reading and writing proficiency, what they know about the subject matter, ELA, math, um, also their performance, this is more data that you are collecting, and also their personality traits. You know, the data, when you when you have it, it may precision partner two people that should work together according to data, but you know your class, so you know mm, these two people probably shouldn't work together because of whether one is reserved, one bullies the other, or they just don't like each other. So you know your class, and so you first start with the data and then arrange according to how you know your students. So just a quick also review of how you precision partner. You take your data. The first thing you want to do is you don't put high students with low students. Why? Because they're both going to get frustrated. Either the high student's going to get just work on everything and not help that low student, or they're going to try and help the low student, and the low student is not going to understand a thing that the high student says, and vice versa. The low student is going to get frustrated because they don't understand anything that the high student says. So we don't put number one with number 30. What you do is you take your data, cut it in half, Put them right next to each other. One is paired with 16, two is paired with 17, three is paired with 18, 15 is paired with 30, and then you adjust how they work together. So we wanna talk about when precision partnering would actually be appropriate. You don't do it for every single thing you're doing in class, but you need to be very strategic when you plan your lesson. It's really when there's more academic language and more structure is needed. And so in order to like not frustrate yourself as well, where I've got to do precision partner for every single one of these activities, pick one set of data and create your seating chart for students so that they are already precision partnered. And then when you're planning, you can make your decisions about this activity, I'm gonna use precision partnering, so I'm gonna teach them how to partner. But also, Allison has a quick story about precision partnering gone wrong. So. So I was in high school, uh, it was my senior math class, we were at the end of the year and we are going to do a statistics project. And our teacher told us, okay, I'm going to assign your partners based on your last test score. And so I got partnered with this guy named Trent Christensen. And afterwards, my friend came up to me and said, wow, Trent either did really bad on his last test or you did really good on your last test. And I thought, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> I'm a pretty good student, but 
one thing to consider when you're doing precision partnering is kids know who the smart kids are and who the dumb kids are. Yeah, so be really careful that you're not saying, I'm using this set of data for your seating chart. Can always go wrong. Mm -hmm. Keep that a secret because like Allison said, they know and they figure it out pretty quickly. All right, so now we're gonna talk about like when is it actually appropriate in specific content. For example, in ELA, doing a partner reading or a dyad reading, using it for peer feedback. The next is in social studies, analyzing of primary sources, using document-based questions, to uh, answering document-based questions. In science, reading and analyzing data or reading for information. And in math, it's practicing already learned skills, reviewing skills, using test corrections. Notice that the thing, the, the commonality with all four of these is it is specific to skills that they need to um, have in order to be successful in the, in the task or the activity that you're doing. So if, if it's something that they need to skill up, that's where precision partnering would be the best option for you. On the other hand, there's randomized grouping. And there's some new research from Canada from Peter Lillidal. And he found that when students work in random partners, they begin to cross social boundaries and form an awareness about each other in ways that were not happening before. So like I mentioned before, like kids know who the dumb kids are and they know who the smart kids are. Um, when Peter was interviewing students, he would ask them, well, why are you in this group? And they would say, oh, well, I'm in this group because Bobby's really smart and I don't know this stuff very well, so I have to work with Bobby. Versus if you do purely randomized groups, they don't know why they're in a group and they're just random students and they begin to step up in ways that they might not step up if they know that you, the teacher, are putting them into groups. So when would it be appropriate um, to do randomized grouping versus precision partnering? Like Rachel mentioned, precision partnering is about the skill, um, very level one, maybe level two thinking. If we want students to go a little bit deeper and start to explore and brainstorm and generate new ideas, then randomized grouping might be the structure that you would want to use for that activity. In order to form purely randomized groups, Peter found in his research that it has to be visibly randomized. The teacher just couldn't say, oh, I randomized your groups because students didn't believe there. What you need to do, how what we've seen some students do is they have a deck of playing cards and maybe they're gonna group by numbers today and the teacher has them spread out as students walk in and the students pick a card. That way students know that it is purely random or they can use a randomizer app to say, okay, here's all your names, push the randomizer app, there you go. Here's your random groups. Groups need to change for each activity. For our, our classes that are on about an hour, that may just be one activity per hour or per, uh, per class period. But if we're on a block schedule, you may have two activities that day. So if you're gonna do two activities, you need to have two randomized groups. And he found that the optimal group number is three. If you put them into pairs, then one tends to dominate, which you may want if you're working on a skill. And if you put them in groups of four, then two people tend to dominate and the other two kind of fade back in the shadows, which we don't want because we want everyone to participate. So here's some examples of where we could do some randomized grouping. In ELA, if you're working on a collaborative project or you're doing some peer reviews, maybe you're doing some brainstorming or some research on a certain topic for like a current event in the news. In social studies, you could be, maybe you're comparing and contrasting historical figures or historical events. Uh, maybe you're having students draw a conclusion from a primary source that they already read in a precision partner. Or you could do a which is it activity. Um, a popular one is Christopher Columbus. Is he a friend or a foe? Did he help or hinder, you know, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Having them come to their own opinion. In science, you could do randomized grouping if you're doing predictions, what would happen on phenomena. Maybe you put them in a precision partner to read, uh, 
to read for information from an article, and then you do a randomized grouping for them to come up with their prediction. Uh, if you're testing a hypothesis, if you're conducting experiments, then randomized groupings would definitely be appropriate. In math, if you're exploring new content with the students or introducing new ideas, or if you're having them work on a task, something that they don't necessarily working on a specific skill, but has multiple entry points and multiple ways of solving the problem, because we want to value all ideas. So let's test your knowledge of whether you would do precision partnering or randomized grouping. So we're going to put an activity up. Would you structure it using precision partnering or randomized grouping? So students will be writing rough drafts of a paper comparing the qualities of the allied leaders versus the Axis leaders in World War II. Precision, randomized. All right, chemistry. Students are practicing how to balance the chemical equations with coefficients on both sides. ELA. Students will be doing a close read of a passage in order to gain information about a current news topic. And in math, secondary two, so for those of you who don't math, know math, that's 10th grade, students are beginning a new unit on completing the square and will be engaging in a task about quilting. So thank you. We're not going to go over what the right answers are of those because it really is how you want to structure your class and what your outcome and purpose is. We chose a few tasks that could, some of them could be precision or um, randomize. But again, it's how you want to structure your class and what the outcome and purpose is for those activities. So thank you for watching. And if you want to know more, come to our Digital Teaching and Learning Summit. We have two classes that we will be doing. One is specific to math, where you and it's called Building Thinking Classrooms in Math. And then it's also Building Thinking in Classrooms in All Subjects. And so you can learn more about visible, group, uh, visible randomized grouping.